All right, hello everyone. I am back to talk about the Rashis of Jyotish again. <clears throat> and this time we're gonna talk about Scorpio. Now the Rashis of Jyotish. So this is a course that's basically, I'm, I'm going and referring back to the Brihat Parashra Horus Shastra, which is considered to be in modern times like the Bible of Vedic astrology, um, the major source text, although it didn't even really exist until the 80s and it was recompiled. So um, there's still a lot of things within this text that have not been fully integrated um, <clears throat> into a lot of the way that Jyotishis practice Jyotish. So that's why it's so cool to talk about it. <clears throat> As one student of astrology once told me, <clears throat> and I'll never forget it because it was so true, I was talking about how important it is to know the fundamentals. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, all the best astrologers talk about the fundamentals as if they are the most advanced thing. Um, and yeah, that was really insightful of him to say that. And that's very true. So know your basics, know your fundamentals. And with that, <clears throat> let's read what Prashra says about the basics of the Scorpio Rashi. <clears throat> okay, so Scorpio, the Scorpion Rashi. Parashra says, small-limbed, many-footed, a Brahmin, in a hole, abiding in the north, rich in vigor during the day, tawny, exposed to water and land, bristles abounding, and very sharp-pointed is the scorpion ruled by Mars. Now, um, this translation, I think, is a little bit more accurate, a little bit more insightful, since the normal translation, if you have the book, it's translated from Sanskrit into Hindi and then from Hindi into English, so it loses a lot. Um, Small-limbed, that's perfect. So Scorpios are actually the smaller people in general. The opposite sign, Taurus, Prashra says is tall or long and longer body. The word he uses long, which means tall. Um, so Taurus people will be very tall in general. If it's like afflicted or different things are there, it makes it different. But that's, you know, the general nature of that sign. And the general nature of Scorpio is to be small and slender and compact and like dense and, and intense. Um, so small limb, they're smaller and they're more slender too. I don't, maybe it's not Prasha, but one of the other texts tells us that Scorpio is a little bit slender. That's really true as well. So people who have that, also, this is what's described as a Pitta body type, is this Scorpio body type, that it, and Scorpio is Pitta, ruled by Mars. So that smaller, slender, kind of like fiery body type, right away when you see that, that's a hint about a lot of Scorpio, maybe they're a Scorpio Swampshire, Scorpio Sun or Rising Sun. I can think of one family member I know who's got four planets in Scorpio and is like very like a kind of smaller, but he's kind of more muscular, but, he, but he's still small and slender, you know? Um, <clears throat> so you have to, if you want to, you know, try to go into predicting body types, you need to know what the bodies of each of the Rashis are described as. So small limbed, um, many footed, you know, the, the Rashis are described as being biped, the human like signs, two footed mean, means you're a human, you're upright, you're intelligent, you're sophisticated, like the Gemini sign or Aquarius. Um, to be many, to be quadruped, remember, like Aries and Leo was about like bearing burdens more, like a like an ox, you know, or like Taurus. See, Scorpio is unique. Only Scorpio and Cancer are the signs that are described as being many footed, and many footed seems to imply this, um, this like kind of <clears throat> adaptability, and um, it's it's not quite like you're you're evolved and upright, but you're. And you're not quite like this earthy burden bearing thing. You're mini footed. You're like, like these insects, you know, it's like you can cling to things. Um, Cancer and Scorpio are both signs of the emotions and the water and the bond we have and, and needing to cling to that thing. Like how a lobster or a crab can just cling to a rock, you know, when the water's just smashing up against it. Um, the mini footed implies that it, it also implies like traveling, um, you know, yeah, not, not bearing burdens, not about that, but moving, in smaller ways, but in sophisticated ways, sort of. So it almost kind of speaks to implying this sort of sort of turning within, you know what I mean? Which they're Brahmin signs, so they're like um, the many-footed quality of an insect. It's just like fine, and it's not it's not like these wings that are reaching out. You know, it kind of is is internalized. 
Um, so there's a little bit more of a water quality. And then that leads into this Abrahman. The next thing he says is Abrahman. And so Abrahman is a, a spiritual internal internalized person. So Scorpio is not really thought of as being very spiritual, maybe in other traditions, like in Western astrology, but Scorpio is a Brahmin sign. And it is just like, just as spiritual as the Pisces and the Cancer signs. But it's funny because it's ruled by Mars and it is, you know, it's, it has a Tamasic quality to it. So it's more like they're the type of uh, Brahmins who are waking up because they have to, because their, you know, life is so full of suffering because of the, the pain, whereas Pisces and Cancer will be inspired to wake up just because of their inspiration. So Scorpio is the sign of being in a hole as well. I just love that. So, you know, I talk a lot on my channel about environments and stuff. So Scorpio is a sign that rules holes, pits, caves. Um, Yvonne Jataka talks about that a little bit more, that text, but in a hole. Yeah, so Scorpio people will like to be in a hole um, more so than others, or that's where they will work. They will, you know, depending on how Scorpio is going, but if that's your fourth house, um, or if you have just a lot of things in Scorpio where you're comfortable with that, you'll be comfortable living in a little dark cave-like home compared to someone else, you know, who needs a luscious environment. Um, it also means that, you know, Scorpio is a sign of our vulnerabilities. And so, you know, when you're hurt and when you're feeling vulnerable, like the scorpion, you retreat back into your hole, you know, and that's also kind of very similar to cancer, which is like a crab, which can go and hide back in its hole. Um, now, what is what your hole is, what you retreat to depends on how good or bad Scorpio is, how afflicted it is or not. And we will show and I'll show this in examples. Um, for example, Yogananda, you know, had a K2 in Scorpio and a strong Scorpio emphasis in his life. And he but the Lord that was very dignified and strong, had good aspects. So he retreated into the whole of God and meditation and spirituality. Um, whereas, you know, I'll show the example of Hunter S. Thompson, who retreated into a bunch of drugs and, and, you know, crazy episodes and didn't, you know, ended up committing suicide and didn't really have a great ending um, for his life. So there's just different, um, you know, holes that you'll go into depending on the type of Scorpio you are, right? Depending on what type of karma you're faced with, we should say. Um, abiding in the North. All the water signs abide in the north. We've already talked about that. Um, rich in vigor during the day. So it's actually said to be day strong, which I really don't. I mean, I naturally would have thought Scorpio was night strong. I think most people would think that. The only reason I can think that the sages would give it as day strong is because Scorpio is where the moon gets debilitated. It's a sign of our vulnerabilities. And that stuff comes out at night. You know what I mean? Um, Scorpio, Jaimini describes Scorpio as a sign of demons and dealing with your demons and issues. And those sort of things are vulnerabilities, our issues, our demons, our psychic disturbances, all this stuff tends to hit us more at night. So it's not, so, you know, that, that would to me explain why it's not a night strong sign and more of a day strong sign. Um, it's said to be tawny. So has a little bit of, of, a, of a light golden color to it, but not really. Um, and in practice, I find Scorpio as the color brown working really well. Scorpio tends to rule things that are brown colored. Um, then we see that it is also said to be exposed to water and land. It's very interesting. So that's showing that kind of adaptable nature, how it has this, uh, it's needing to both develop like emotionally in the watery realm and spiritually and internally, but it's also ruled by Mars, who's said to be, you know, Kuja, born from the earth, earth born, you know? Um, Mars is all about, you know, working the earth and working the land. And, and you know, Mars wants to see logical, concrete results and um, ha wants to have his feet on the ground as well. So that's sort of an, uh, something you'll notice about Scorpios. Um, they, they're, not just like Pisces and Cancer who are totally in the water, totally just emotional and more feeling oriented. Then we see that Scorpio is bristles abounding. This is so cool. It's been said that that sort of hints at 
Scorpio as being so sensitive, so psychically sensitive. You know, these little bristles and, and hairs and things that are on insects and creatures alert them to the most minute changes in the temperature or the environment, you know? Um, so that's Scorpio. Um, ever since I got initiated into the Kriya Yoga tradition and started meditating more, um, like 12 years ago, I would start to develop this quality where when I would hear something really true, my hair would just stand on end, you know? And so that, the, the bristles abounding, you know, when you hear, when something really gets you and it's like, makes your hair stand up on your, on your arms and everything and um, kind of has to do with that quality of Scorpio. So being highly sensitive, highly psychically sensitive as well, spiritually, but just sensitive in general. Um, and he says, and very sharp pointed, is the scorpion ruled by Mars, which is so cool because Scorpio, you know, it's a scorpion with the stinger and a point. So yeah, it's a sign of battles, weapons, fighting, all this, but it's really also about being very sharp pointed. Like Scorpio people can be so sharp with what they are doing and what they're into. It's really an asset. It's really a strength to this sign is how sharp it gets. Maybe the sharpest of all the signs, you know? Um, so let me flesh that out. Let me explain that with some examples. Here's the chart of Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick's considered a genius. Um, he's considered to be one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. He ha he's said to have an IQ of 200. I think Stephen Hawking's was like said to be like 160 in comparison. And you know, yeah, really true, great, brilliant, genius people tend to not want to play that role of like a Stephen Hawking person. You know, they would rather be creative because when the higher you, the more intelligent you are, the more of God's creative intelligence is flowing through you, the more creative you want to be. So he was a filmmaker. He, he innovated. He did, he made the first sci-fi film ever, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey, which has been parodied and, you know, it, from ever since, you know, to the point where if you haven't seen it, it's almost, too, it's almost too unfortunate because almost every major scene in that movie has been copied and parodied and satired and made fun of a thousand times over since. I mean, that's how big of an impact this man had. Um, a Clockwork Orange, Full Metal Jacket. Um, all his movies are just like, you know, they're just not your average movie. They're really, really well thought out. And he was a brilliant person. Um, so look at his moon. Is His moon is his Atma Karaka and it's in Scorpio. Remember, the moon is only truly debilitated according to Parashra in the first zero to three degrees of Scorpio. So I find that to be really true. And even if it's debilitated there, it's not that bad of a thing because it's not in the sign of an enemy. Um, but it does show, you know, a lower state of the moon. But this guy, Stanley Kubrick, he also had his moon in Anuradha Nakshatra, and he was very, so at the same time as being, sh very, being very sharp, he was also very, um, you know, like friendly and loving and sociable, and he stayed married to his wife his entire life, as, and, you know, was like this huge director who, you know, a lot of those guys are much more promiscuous and do what they, kind of do whatever they want, you know, and he was not like that, and he stayed um, married to his wife, whom he loved his entire life. Um, he was a pretty, pretty good uh, family, uh, family man and, and husband and things like that. He was just incredibly sharp, you know, IQ of 200. I mean, this guy was brilliant. And um, that's not proven or anything or documented because back then you didn't, you know, you didn't, you didn't really just go around carrying a certificate of your IQ or something. You didn't have the internet or all this stuff back then. But another example was that he would, um, I read, a, I read his biography when I was younger. I was really fascinated with this guy. And he would um, actually, when someone disagreed with him about how he was making one of his films, he would have a chess game right there about the issue. And if they could beat him in chess, he would take their advice. And he would say, your move, your move is better. You know what I mean? But if they couldn't beat him in a game of chess, he would take his own advice. <laughs> and he would stick to what he was doing. I think that's kind of also evident because of the, you know, Scorpio is sharp minded in what it knows, you know, and uh, it's, it's very intuitive and kind of strong in that sense. But it's also we can see that he had a son in Leo, you know, and his ruling planet Venus was there with the sun. So it's kind of agitated by that sun, that intelligence. Um, so anyways, that's just one example of an intense Scorpio guy, very deep, 
very thoughtful, very sharp pointed. Now here, here is the chart of Paramhansa Yogananda. Um, I've talked about him in the past and we'll no doubt talk about him more in the future. So I'm not going to spend forever on this, but just notice that he had K2 in Scorpio. Um, he had it in the Svati Nakshatra of individuality and being a very unique individual human. And yeah, for sure with Yogananda. And uh, the K2 in Scorpio meant that he was very strong in the ability to go into the hole, the ability to have bristles abounding, be intuitive, being very sharp. You know, this was a kid that, you know, when he was, before he was even an, a legal official adult, he had met, you know, he meditated for over a day at one point, like up in his closet for 24 hours, you know, when he was like 12 or 13, or I don't remember the details, but, you know, you read his autobiography of a yogi. And that is one of the most inspiring books on the planet for spiritual seekers. And so he was very familiar with the K2 Scorpio realm. And also his teachers, his masters told him that he had been a Himalayan, a Himalayan yogi in the past and had, you know, lived that kind of blissful life, just radiating his, his vibrations out into the world, but had stayed out of the world in past lives. And that is K2 and Scorpio, you see. And so he needed to go into the world in this life with Rahu in the 10th house and an earth sign in Taurus. He needed to go and, you know, go to America and be stuck, you know, trying to tell Americans to meditate, which was like kind of a waste of his energy at a certain point as an instrument, you know, after a certain amount of saying that so many times, it, it's, it's like, you know, okay, just let your students start talking about that so that you can go off and go back into your hole and meditate. Um, also, what's neat is Scorpio rules the desert. At the end of Yogananda's life, he moved to the desert, 29 Palms, and, and stayed in the desert away from his SRF organization and just focused on writing his um, book about Christ and his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, which are these amazing, massive treaties of tons of knowledge. And uh, yeah, the fourth house also has to do with your home and residence. So it's cool that he lived in the desert. Here we see Ramana Maharshi. This is a chart of Ramana Maharshi. Um, he's also a self-realized yogi. You'll notice here that his ruling planet is Venus. He's a Libra, and his ruling planet Venus goes to Scorpio. And so that also hints to a life of working through your vulnerabilities, a life of the Brahmin energy, and that sort of thing. And he also has a really strong, he has a fallen Saturn aspecting it. Um, but it has 100% dig bala in the seventh house, which really helps. And it is exalted in the Shastyamsa. So you might be seeing that Saturn be like, wait, what? Um, don't worry too much about that Saturn because the rest, you know, it actually is much stronger in a lot of the other ways. But it is fallen. And Rahu was also <clears throat> aspecting this Venus. And Rahu's with the sun. His father actually died when he was young, and that was what made him uh, want to know what is death? What is what? What he was just here, now he's not. What is? What am I? You know, and and he laid down and actually tried to die and tried to pretend he had died, and basically did like this sort of meditation, kind of innately on his own, obviously because he had done so much spiritual work from past lives. And he ended up having a realization and then from there on just kept trying to get more and more realized and never fell from that state. So we can see that the 10th house has got K2 in it, which can, you know, the 10th house of the father, K2 there shows some possible loss. And then the son is the father and it was with Rahu and this was an eclipse basically. So he was born in an eclipse. So with involving the father in many ways. So he lost his father, um, Venus is also a second indicator of the father and we have it aspected by these tough things, but because there's so much Brahmin energy going on, Jupiter is in a water sign and Pisces moon is in its own sign. Venus is here. They're all in trines. He has a lot of other good yoga. So overall he went into, he went into the hole in a higher way and really worked out for him. <clears throat> now this is the chart of Bill Cosby. Now, um, Bill Cosby was someone who, uh, you know, was considered a very beloved figure until just recently it came out that he had been um, doing some very nasty Scorpio things and been basically um, been raping women or giving them um, 
what do you call it? Those drugs that roofing them or giving them those drugs that make them pass out and, and then, yeah, doing all kinds of terrible things. And so he has his ruling planet, Mars in Scorpio, and it's aspected by, and that's a strong Mars in its own sign, but look, it's aspected by a debilitated Jupiter. Um, it's aspected by Saturn, um, fallen Saturn. It's aspected by a star of Mars. Mars starves, uh, Mars also hurt, or sorry, Mercury also hurts Mars. It's a hurt, it's an, it's a, a sleep Mercury. And it's aspected by a sun that's, I guess, doing fine. Um, uh, I actually already analyzed this person's, Bill Cosby's chart in a video about Venus. Um, and so you can search for Bill Cosby on my channel and you'll find a more in-depth analysis of this but just to talk about Scorpio stuff, you know what I mean? The hidden life, going into the hole, the vulnerabilities, all this stuff, it can go good or bad. So I showed some saints. So I figured I'd show a more of a sinner figure. And this is Hunter S Thompson. I talked about his chart too, because he was born within a couple weeks of Bill Cosby. And these guys are like totally night and day, different people. One of the only different planets is the moon is that the moon is with Rahu. <clears throat> and when the moon is with Rahu, you get thrown into the Rahu zone earlier in life because the moon rules that early age in life and for other reasons. So Hunter S. Thompson was thrown into the jungle, the Rahu, the craziness, the drugs early on and didn't feel the need to hide from that. You see, whereas Bill Cosby didn't have that and just had the Venus K2. So he was so focused on getting the Venus, the, the fame, the graces in the third house of acting and comedy and, comedy and stuff like that. So I talked about this already, but this is another Scorpio figure, Hunter S. Thompson. You can read about it. This is the chart of Ramakrishna. So Ramakrishna is a great figure, um, a crazy Bhakta figure, a crazy lover of God, devotee of God, um, who was so in love with God that he would just like see the Divine Mother. He would feel her. He would hear her coming up the steps, you know, stuff like that. Um, he was very devoted to the to goddess worship, and um, no one really will deny that Ramakrishna was not self realized and God realized. It was just he was he impacted too many people. It was just too well known. It was like two plus two equals four. It's just hard to deny. Um, and you know he had his ruling planet in Scorpio in a in the Brahmin sign. You know, um, and he had it. You see, we don't have this terrible fallen Saturn thing hitting it. We don't have Rahu hitting it. We have just an exalted Jupiter hitting it. And in the Ardra Nakshatra, which is very uh, prominent for spiritual figures. And um, he also has, had aspected by Venus. So the two Brahmin planets. You see, so, you know, read that Scorpio. Don't just look at Scorpio and be like, oh, your son is in Scorpio. Oh, you're going to be a, a crazy murderer or a crazy party animal or a drug addict you know, that's, that's not scientific. And that's the type of thinking that has made people not want to do astrology or not consider it. But when we look at things more sophisticated and more detail, we see the grander picture of what type of Scorpio situation is going to unfold for each person. All right, thanks. Yeah, I hope that helps you guys understand the Scorpio Rashi. Let me know if you have any questions, you know, or if any of it was not clear. I'll do my best to elaborate in the comments. Thank you.